so glad to have so many people here joining me to talk about observability with spring-based distributed systems. My name is Tommy Ludwig, and my Twitter handle is up there, so if you're on Twitter and you feel so inclined, I'm always happy to have people tweeting at me about observability and other spring things. This is essentially the same slide, but with my company template. I work for a company called Rock10. How many people here have heard of Rock10 before? Oh, not too bad, about a third maybe? Great. Well, let's get started. We've got a lot to cover, so I wanna jump right in. So this talk has a couple of assumptions built in, some of them built in right into the title. So for instance, the title mentions spring-based distributed systems, so I assume that people here are developing spring-based distributed systems. Some other assumptions is that I'm assuming some basic knowledge of Spring Boot because we're going to talk about how auto configuration and configuration that can be done by the Spring environment through properties helps integrate these tools that we're going to talk about. It's also an assumption that you care about your user experience because if you didn't, observability doesn't especially matter. So agenda, we're going to go over the what and why of observability. And then we're going to talk about three pillars of observability and how to implement these with Spring, specifically logging, metrics, and tracing. And then we're going to talk about how you kind of put all of these together and make it into a more cohesive um, observability system. So I want to kind of go piece by piece on the title here and break it down a little bit. So to start off with observability. If we're going to talk about how to do observability, first we need to talk about what is observability. So I've given just one definition here so that we can establish a common understanding. There are many definitions that you could give for observability, but I hope this one is helpful. So I've written, observability is achieved through a set of tools and practices that aim to turn data points and context into insights. I'll repeat again. A set of tools and practices that aims to turn data points and context into insights. This is what observability is essentially aiming to achieve. So observability is also beyond traditional monitoring, where traditional monitoring is maybe a series of up and down checks. Is this check up or is it down? And when it comes to distributed systems in particular, distributed systems with the added complexity and points of failure make it so that your distributed system as a whole is always in some partial state of failure or degradation. So the simplistic view of simply up or down is maybe not enough for these real world scenarios that come when you're building distributed systems. So you need to be able to expect the unexpected because the unexpected will become very common as you build larger and larger distributed systems. You need to be able to answer questions that you don't know up front. So when you're making these traditional monitoring systems with up and down checks, you have these predetermined checks. You know what you want to have an up or down dashboard for. But when it comes to distributed systems, things will fail in unexpected ways. And so you need to be able to dig into that and answer these kind of questions as they come up. So hopefully that sets up what observability is, but why should you care? So I'm going to start with an assumption here that you want to provide a great experience for users of your system. And then I would posit that focusing and building a good observability system gives you confidence in production. Because after all, nothing is actually production except for production itself. Staging environments are inherently somehow different than production. So if they say a picture is worth a thousand words, I say production is worth a thousand development environments. So observability gives you that confidence. You know what's actually happening in production. And I would say without observability, all you're really doing is hoping that production is okay, hoping that your user experience isn't compromised. And this confidence is, I think, a prerequisite for doing many things in production that can help improve your product and improve your user experience. Things like automated cannery testing, doing testing and production in general, including things like chaos engineering. You really need a good observability system established to be able to do these things. And then I also think that observability has a lot to do with ownership. 
So I think as developers, we should have a sense of ownership in the products and software that we're building. But if you want to take ownership in something, you also, you also should arm yourself with the tools so that you can actually be a good owner of this software and of this product that you're putting out. Amazon CTO Werner Vogels famously said, you build it, you run it. But I think it's not enough to just say you build it, you run it. You also need to be able to observe it. And maybe that's part of running it, but this is where you need this observability system. And then mean time to recovery, I think is really key and critical to your business operations. Speaking before about how distributed systems are always in a constant partial state of failure or partial degradation, you have to accept that things are going to go wrong in production. And it's not a matter of trying to eliminate failure because it's going to creep in. So you need to really focus on recovering as quickly as possible. So I've written three things here, early detection, fast recovery, and increased understanding. And this is what you're trying to get with a good observability system. Next, spring base. So this is a spring conference after all, so I want to make this talk relevant to you as developers working with Spring. Many of the tools that we're going to talk about are actually usable outside of a Spring context, but I'm going to try to gear things so that you can get the most out of using these tools with your Spring application. And I'm going to talk about that in each section when we get into the specifics. But first, to start off with, there's this tool that many of you, I assume, know called Spring Boot Actuator. So Spring Boot Actuator is awesome. You add a dependency to the class path, and you get a ton of things out of the box. You get things like a health endpoint. You can check your Spring environment, check configuration properties. You can check an auto configuration report, and so much more. But is this enough to be able to debug and understand what's going on with your applications? Like most things, the answer is kind of nuanced. It depends, right? It depends exactly what went wrong and what information you need. But the information that Spring Boot Actuator provides is inherently local to a specific application instance. And when you're talking about distributed systems, a lot of times you need distributed knowledge. There's also another tool called Spring Boot Admin. And this kind of takes all of those Spring Boot Actuator endpoints and makes them available from one centralized tool. There was actually a talk at the conference today about Spring Boot Admin. This is a great tool, and it's very helpful. But again, this is kind of just taking that local information and then making it available in a central place, but still you have to look at the information one instance at a time, essentially. And so for some distributed problems that come up, this still is maybe not enough. So speaking of distributed system, distributed systems always add complexity. And so we need a way to, to deal with and manage that complexity. Just to give a brief view of what I mean by distributed, and I'm not going to make the argument for whether you should be doing distributed systems or not. There could be a whole talk on that topic, but assuming that you are doing a distributed system, it might look something like the right, whereas a similar system might look something on the left, where the left is one single process that has components inside of it that are called. And on the right, you've taken those components and you've moved them out to their own separate processes. If you have everything inside one process, then that one process can get holistic insight of itself and then individual insight into the components that it's made up of. But on the right, everything's now its own process, and so it has its own insight that's separate. Distributed systems are inherently hard, and so we need tools and techniques and processes to make this easier. And distributed systems makes observability itself harder. As I mentioned, if you weren't distributing things, maybe using the actuator endpoints could be sufficient. So any request in a distributed system inherently spans multiple processes. So you need insight from all of those processes. And because you have more processes, you're going to have more points for potential failure. And so you need to take this local insight that you have and stitch it together into a more collective insight about your distributed system that you can then slice and drill down into different parts depending on where you can identify the problem is happening. And then also, 
not necessarily requisite for distributed systems, but doing things like scaling and using ephemeral instances makes observability also more difficult because you don't necessarily know where your instances are, or how many you have at a given time, but you still need to get that insight from them. So I want to talk about the three pillars, as I said, logging, metrics, and tracing. So these are just three sides to observability. There are other pillars, but we're going to focus on these three for the purpose of this talk. And so these are kind of non-functional requirements that you might have for your application when you're building it. And I think that there are some, some of these can be made generic that apply to all of your applications. Some of them are specific to a domain or specific to an application. But this is something that you need to think about when you're designing your system or designing an application. And some overlap exists, but it's really best to use all three of these to get the most insight. So Peter Borgen, after going to a distributed tracing workshop, wrote a blog article that I have uh, linked in the bottom right there. And this diagram is from his blog article. And you can see he's kind of broken down what's unique about these three and how they have some overlap. And you can see that each has kind of a different context and volume. But as I mentioned, we want to try to combine all three of these for the best effect. So I mentioned that these are non-functional requirements for your application. And non-functional requirements have a way of kind of being an afterthought, kind of taking less precedence to functional requirements. And I like to think, as a developer myself especially, that developers are inherently lazy. We want to take the easy route. We don't want to introduce complexity unless we need to. It's not a bad thing. It prevents you from doing things that you don't need to. It encourages automation. And it, but because of this, we especially need to be able to get observability as easily as possible. So when it comes to logging metrics and tracing, we need these common needs that are common to most applications to just kind of work out of the box. And then if you have custom needs, you need to be able to add those with only a little bit of extra effort. So this is kind of a variant on the 80-20 rule where you can get 80% of the merit for only 20% of the effort. And I'll kind of show how this works within each section as we move forward. So starting with logging, I think logging is maybe most familiar to developers. So logging in general, is, I think, arbitrary messages that you want to find later. And these messages are formatted so that it gives context to that message. And some common things that are included in this context are logging levels and timestamps, so you know when the logging message was, how important or the severity of that logging message. And some examples of what you would put in the message part after that are exceptions or stack traces or maybe you're providing some additional context to what's going on in the application at that point in execution, or maybe access logs so you can know what kind of requests you receive, what kind of responses you sent, and maybe even logging those response bodies in certain situations. So this is how logging is used in general. So let's go through a scenario where you have application one and application two, and application one is calling application two. But of course, you want high availability, availability, so you have two instances of each. And you've got these running on a VM. Could be a container, physical, but for the purposes, we'll say it's a VM. And you've got logs being generated on each of those instances. And so app one is calling app two, but then, boom, something goes wrong. And you're sitting there thinking, I would really like to check those logs right now. So what might you have to do in this kind of basic logging scenario? Well, now you got to get the logs from each of the instances to figure out where went wrong, where what went wrong. So you retrieve the logs from each instance and then collect them somewhere, and now you got to search through each of the logs. Who has ever done something like this? I know I have. Most people. So 
I mean, one instance in which you would do this normally without thinking is if you're debugging locally, if you're running two applications locally and you want to point them at each other and figure out what's going on. But there are, of course, some problems with doing things in this kind of simplistic manner. So I would say it doesn't scale very well. There's too much work and too much knowledge required. The more app applications you have, the more instances you have, the less manageable this is. And what I mean by knowledge required is you need to know the address for each instance so that you can get the logs from that somehow. Maybe you can use the actuator endpoint if you're using file logging. There's an actuator endpoint to retrieve the log file. And maybe you're using Spring Boot Admin so it's easier to get to that endpoint. But still, inherently, you have to get the logs from each instance. And then the logs will be mixed and you really just want to know what went wrong with that one request, and you're trying to find that. So how do you search the logs? Do you use grep or sed or copy and paste the logs to some kind of text editor? So this is, in a sense, low usability. Your, searching, your search ability is limited, and it's difficult. And as I mentioned, when you're receiving concurrent requests, the log lines themselves are going to be intermixed. So it's going to be harder to identify if I'm looking at logs sequentially from the same request or different requests. So what you want to do, if you have that same setup and you still have app one calling app two, how you could maybe improve the situation is to use something called centralized logging. So rather than having the logs on each instance, you want to have the logs streamed to some kind of central log service. And you want to do this in near real time so that if something goes wrong, you can check and see what's happening in near real time. And the centralized log service here provides some kind of query, querying capability. So you can send some kind of request to this to retrieve logs that match some criteria, and you can get back the logs. So this kind of fixes that problem of having to check each instance individually and the toil involved in doing that. And so to get this kind of setup where you have log streaming to a central service and that service provides querying, I'm not going to go into all the details about how to do this because I want to focus on the parts of how Spring can help with this situation. But that being said, there are a few tools out there that can do this kind of thing. So the Elasticsearch log stash Kibana stack is known for doing this kind of thing, where you can, that central service can be an elastic search that you're sending the logs to, and then you can use Kibana as a UI. There are other services, Splunk, Logly. If you're using a platform like Cloud Foundry, then this can aggregate logs from all of your instances and then forward them to a syslog endpoint. So there are a lot of ways to achieve this, but this is what you want. And this setup solves some of the problems that we mentioned, but it doesn't quite solve all of them. So if you want to introduce Spring and see what you can get out of that to improve the situation. So previously, the previous slide showed how you centralized logging fixes the aggregation and retrieval problem. But we still need some more. And Spring Boot has some features that help. So for one, Spring Boot allows you to control the log format through the Spring environment. So you want to make sure that you have a common format across all of your applications. And this is because when you're sending those logs to that centralized log store, you need to parse the information from the logs so that you can get that context so you know that the timestamp is in a certain place and in a certain format. And so you can control this for all of your services via the Spring environment. And if you want to easily control the environment for all of your services, Spring Cloud Config is something you should look at. The log levels can also be controlled via the Spring environment. So if, by default, info level logs are enabled. But if you wanted to enable debug logs for maybe a specific package, you can do this with log levels. And this is all in configuration. So, But you can also change these at runtime using one of the actuator endpoints that controls the log levels. And this is good in situations where you want to, you can't, you're not getting enough information that you need in the logs. And so you want to turn up the log level for maybe a specific package or a specific instance and get additional logging information temporarily. And so you can do this at runtime. 
In addition to these features from Spring Boot, there's also Spring Cloud Sleuth. So Spring Cloud Sleuth has a feature that will add a trace ID to your logs for request correlation. So I have some sample logs up here and I've highlighted the trace ID in the log. So Sleuth adds this information to the log format and it also changes the default log format to include this. And you can see it has some other things like the service name. And so you can see in the logs here that the trace ID remains the same across all of the logs, even though the service is changing. So it's going from service one to service two, and they're sharing the same trace ID in the logs. So if you put all of this together, you get centralized request correlated formatted logs that are indexed and searchable across your entire system. So in this way, if you want to find all of the logs for one request as it went in your system and went throughout your system, you can search for this by the trace ID. And of course, you can search by other things such as a time window or specific application log level or something in the message. And Sleuth handles propagating this trace ID from one application to the next. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the tracing part. Next up, talking about metrics. So metrics in general, some characteristics. Metrics are typically time series data. So you have some metric, say for instance, a rep response time metric, and you're recording the response time for each request. And then you're aggregating across this. And then you're observing that metric at some time interval. And so in this way, each time interval, you're getting a new data point, and you'll have a series time series of data points about this metric. And because it's all aggregated in the application, the size is bounded unlike logs. So if you get more requests, the size that the metric takes up doesn't change because it's all aggregated inside the application. And another characteristic is if you're using a dimensional metric system, then you get these dimensions, tags, labels, which are all just different words for the same thing. And these are different ways that you can drill down into metrics. So there's a link at the bottom if you want to read a good article that explains this. But an example of a dimension or tag could maybe be the application name or the region that the application is running in. So you can look at a response time metric and see if the response time is slowed down for an entire region or maybe just for a specific application and look at the data from different views. And the purpose of doing all of this for metrics is that you want to visualize and identify trends and deviation. So you can put these time series into a graph and then visually see how is the data changing. And you can look at things like how has this changed from the last hour to this hour? How did this change from yesterday to today, or from last week to this week? And then you also want to be able to alert based on these metrics. So you can write metrics queries, query these metrics, and then if the threshold is exceeded, you can make an alert and page somebody. Something's wrong. Please look into this. But of course, you want to make sure that these pages are only for impactful events. So this means that the user experience is actually being affected. To give some examples of metrics, we talked about response time earlier. This is an example of a timer type metric. And some tags you might have for that are something like the URI that was used or the status code that was returned, the HTTP method that was used. And so timers can also count how many times. So if you're counting the number of requests that were made and then timing them, you can get the count, the max, you can get a rate over this. Another type is gauges, say the number of classes loaded by the JVM at a given time. So this can fluctuate up and down. And so this is why you use a gauge to get a point in time value. Response body size, you might want to make as a histogram type, where you get a summary of how many response body sizes were within this range of values, how many were in this range of value kind of like a heat map. And number of garbage collections that have happened or maybe a type of counter that you might want. 
So this is a monotonically increasing value. So if you have a basic metric setup and you're trying to look at something like the HTTP server requests as a timer, and you have users making concurrent requests to your application, and you have your controller in your application somehow instrumented, and that's recording the timing for each request, and saving that timing data as an aggregate into your in-memory store for metrics, then you can expose this over an interface, maybe JMX or HTTP, so that you can look at this later. But of course, you have multiple, app multiple instances of your application, your load balancing requests, and so they're going across to the different instances. And like logs, this turns into the problem where you have to now retrieve your metrics from each individual instance. And again, Spring Boot Admin can help with this, but it's still giving you local instance information about the metrics. And again, this doesn't scale as far as the human work that you have to do to get each of these metrics. So if you want to have an observability-focused metric setup, rather than on-demand retrieval where you're going to each instance and getting the metrics, it's better if you can publish those metrics to a metrics backend system and store those there. And the time series data will be stored there. And you have many metric systems that you can choose from. I'll mention those next. But so you're storing your metrics from each instance now in this backend. So now you can aggregate and slice and drill down on your metrics across all of your instances, across all of your applications in your distributed system because they're all collected into one place. And then you can reference that metrics data and visualize on it. You can make graphs. You can make dashboards. And then you can also reference that and make alerts so you can know when the system is degraded. And then once you have all of this, you can feel relieved and at ease. So how does Spring play into this? So starting with Spring Boot 2, Spring Boot 2 in introduced a new metrics library replacing the previous Spring Boot implementation of metrics called Micrometer. So Micrometer, if you just add the actuator dependency and then you add a specific implementation for a metrics backend, then you get Micrometer metrics in your application. And Micrometer supports many different metrics backends. I've listed some here, Atlas, Datadog, Influx, Prometheus, SignalFX, Wavefront, and I would suggest that, if possible, you do try to use one of the metrics backends that supports dimensional metrics. Not all of them do, but dimensional metrics are very useful for being able to drill down and really look at the data from different views to figure out and pinpoint where the issue might be. So just by adding these dependencies, you get a lot of instrumentation of common components auto-configured out of the box for you. So you get JVM system metrics, you get HTTP server and client requests, you get metrics on Spring Data, RabbitMQ, data source. And again, this goes back to the 80-20 principle. And if you do have some kind of need for custom metrics, something that's specific to your domain, or maybe something that's just common but not implemented yet, it's easy enough to add additional metrics. And these are treated just like the other metrics and can be published to your metrics backend and queried just like the other ones. And of course, all of this is you can easily configure with properties using the Spring environment. So there's the management.metrics space. And under there, there are many properties where you can disable certain metrics or you can enable different distribution properties setting the percentiles that you want to collect for timer metrics or SLAs that you want to meet for timer metrics or percentile histograms if you want to collect those. And this kind of, this controls it by meter ID, but alternatively, you could also use timed annotations to control it locally for a specific request mapping. Another thing that's important is common tags. So you want to have certain common tags that every metric in your application gets, again, so that you can slice and drill down on this. So some common tags that you might want, application name, instance, stack, this dev, staging, production, region, and zone. And so this will let you, again, 
pinpoint if there's an issue local to one of these or if it's common across them. And you can do this with some simple Java configuration. And starting from Spring, Spring Boot 2.1, you'll be able to do common tag configuration with properties. So next, let's talk about tracing. So one of the actuator endpoints, HTTP trace, is there. And this is an example of local tracing. So you can get tracing of recent HTTP requests that have gone to your application. And included in this trace, as you can see from the sample response here, is some latency data and some request meta metadata on top of this. But we're talking about the context of distributed systems, so we need distributed tracing. So distributed tracing is tracing across process boundaries, across your different applications in your distributed system. So this is similar to local tracing, but you need to propagate the context and the hierarchy in which your process is across from one process to another and then join all of this information afterwards. And with this, you gain latency analysis across your distributed system, and it's request scoped. So again, you can look at a trace for a specific request and see the entire um, latency analysis. So the reason why you might, some people often ask, why do we need tracing? Why can't we do this with just metrics or just logging? So metrics lack requests context because metrics are aggregated across requests. And logging has local context, but it's limited in the amount of distributed info that it has. So tracing is really filling this, this void here. So I can get, if I can give you a diagram here, so you have four services, and they're calling each other like is shown here. And what you want to capture with this tracing information is you want to get this hierarchy of service one calling service two, service two calling three and four. And you want to get the timing and metadata about the requests. So I'll walk you through what would happen in this tracing instrumented system here. So you have a user that starts the request, and the request begins at service one. So it starts at service one. There's no trace started yet. So it's going to start this tracing. And at that point, it's going to make a sampling decision. So the sampling decision means that not every request will be traced. Some requests will be traced, but you don't need to get all of them to still get a representative set of tracing data about what's happening in your application. So the higher volume that you have of requests, the lower amount of the lower amount of requests that you need to sample to get a representative um, set of tracing data. So at service one, it's starting it. It's going to decide based on either probability or some other sampling policy that you set whether this trace is going to be traced or not, and then it's going to propagate that decision downstream to other services. So when service one passes the processing over to service two, it needs to propagate that context. So it's propagating the trace context, and when you when this gets into service two and that starts processing, service two is going to see that I've, it's being passed to trace context, so there's a trace already in progress, and it's going to join that trace. And then when each span is done, and the process is in, processing is done in any one service, it's going to report that span data to the tracing backend, and the tracing backend will be able to correlate all of that back to one span. So one example of a tracing backend is Zipkin. And this is an example of what the Zipkin UI looks like, specifically with the setup that was shown before, where you have the four services. And you have service one calling service two, and service two calling three and four. And so you can see this visually here, and you can see the timing information for each one. So this is what you get when you visualize this distributed tracing data. So to talk about the architecture a little bit, I mentioned that the spans are reported to the tracing backend. So in the case of Zipkin, you have different options for ways to transport. You can transport just over HTTP. You can use Kafka, RabbitMQ. And then for where you actually save this tracing data, you can use things like Elasticsearch or Cassandra. There's also a MySQL option, but it doesn't always perform as well when you have lots and lots of tracing data. And the in-memory option is not something recommended for production. So how does Spring fit into all of this? How does Spring help you do this kind of distributed tracing? So you can pick a tracing backend. I mentioned Zipkin because it's 
easy to get started with and it integrates well with Spring, but there are other, there are other tracing backends. So if you just run a Zipkin server, which there's a quick getting started guide how, how to do that, then you'll have your tracing backend running and then you just need to instrument your applications and have those send tracing data. And so you can do this pretty simply by adding the Zipkin starter to your application, which is part of Spring Cloud Sleuth. And then this will use Zipkin's Brave library to instrument your application. And then it'll have integrations with common parts of your application that you want to trace. So HTTP server and client interactions, if you have any runnables or callables in your application, or if you're using Spring messaging or integration, it'll make spans for these and have the timing and latency requests. But you need to make sure that you're using the instrumented components. So if you just do new REST template, then there's no way for Sleuth to know about that or instrument it. So in that case, you wouldn't get span data created from that. And then the library and auto configuration also takes care of reporting these traces to your tracing backend. And it does this in a asynchronous batched way so that it has little to no impact on your running application. If your tracing backend is down, it's not going to bring your application down. It's designed so that this doesn't happen. And of course, you can also configure this with properties. One of the main things you want to configure is the sampling probability. Again, the higher volume of requests that you have, the lower sampling that you should need to get a representative set of traces. And the default is 10%. So if you don't change this and you just try this out locally, you might be wondering, why do I have no traces in my back end? And it's because by default, only one out of every 10 requests will be traced. So now if I can put all of this together, the main idea is that you have these three different components, logging, metrics, and tracing, but they're all correlated in some way. So Adrian Cole, who is the lead maintainer for Zipkin, had a talk where he presented this diagram, and you can see that there are IDs that connect and correlate across these three different systems so that you can get from one to another and get different insight depending on what you need for what you're trying to investigate. So the IDs tie everything together. So for instance, you have the trace ID that's in your tracing data, and you've also put that trace ID in your logging data. So you can jump directly from your tracing data to the same logging data for that tr one trace ID. And you have things like the application name that's shared among all three of these. So if you want to look at the logging metrics and tracing for a given application, you can correlate on that. And here it says RPC name. So this for an HTTP request would be like the URI that you're calling. So if you want to look at the metrics and the search the tracing data for this, then you can also do that. And so this makes it easier to jump from one and use the right tool for the right job. And kind of putting this all together and how you would use these, I like to think of it in this kind of observability cycle here. So you're trying to detect that there is an issue or something that's abnormal, and then you need to investigate that issue and then recover and adjust from whatever degradation is happening. And so you're constantly collecting this observability data across your applications throughout your system, and you're running these, you're checking for alerts and you're checking for reports, and when you get something, then you're going to go to your metric system, look at the metric systems, try to drill down and figure out if you can see what the cause is, what the problem is. And if you can find it there, then great. You can triage the issue there and make adjustments and fix the problem. But if metrics alone are not enough, then because everything's correlated, you can jump from those metrics where you saw something wrong into the tracing data and try to find a trace where you can see more detail on what actually went wrong. And maybe there you can find the issue. But if you can't find the issue there, you can then jump from that tracing data to the logs for that trace and get some more detail, maybe a stack trace or some additional context that you've left yourself in the logs. And so in this way, you can really jump from one to the other to get more detail and look at the right thing to find the right problem and fix this as quickly as possible. So to kind of wrap up, 
the key takeaways, I think, is that in a distributed system, it's really critical that you have system-wide observability. It's not enough to have good insight into one application or one instance. You really need to know what's going on across your applications because the problems will also become distributed and that it's not a failure in a single application. It's maybe a failure across your system. So without observability, it would be too hard to find out what went wrong where and why. And observability really enables that the, what your business cares about, which is recovering from failure quickly. And tools exist for all of these observability needs, and Spring makes it easy to integrate them. And again, with the 80-20 rule, most common cases will, should just work out of the box, where you get a lot without actually having to change your code. And if you do need to make anything custom, it should be easy to do that too, and Spring makes that possible also. And then last, I would just like to say that you should really use the right tool for the right job, and then synergize across them to find the right information that you want. So different problems will need a different combination of metrics, logging, and tracing. But if you have all of them and you set them all up like this, then they're all correlated and you can look across them, get the information that you need. Thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to answer. Any questions? Yes. I'm sorry. So how do you deal with observability of a service uh, in, in interoperability when there is a flaky network? Would you that use logging for that? Or would you use like metrics? For example, there's a library I used in the past called D, which can also get OS metrics. So like uh, uh, packages uh, transferred. So where do, would you put that more? In the logging or in, in the metrics? Yeah, so the question was about flaky network and how you kind of find that using these observability tools. So I think there are different ways you can do it. You can, of course, get OS level metrics. And there are some provided already by Micrometer. And that may give you the answer you need, but it depends. And I think if you can kind of catch these flaky network issues within your application code, then you can, of course, log something for that. So it depends whether you have the ability to recognize this problem within your application or not. And maybe, I mean, I think you can find it in really any of the three, potentially. Because in the tracing, you could see from one service, I've made this request, and then it never gets to this other service. Whereas if I look at other normal requests, I can see that it's clearly getting there. And maybe from that, you can have the clues to figure out that the network is flaky between those points.